Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Um, I hope that you can hear me OK. Sound is all right. Well, uh, I think I would start by saying that it's pretty much across the board that everyone feels that they need a little more of many things. So I would ask you some questions. Do you have enough time? Do you have enough space? Do you have enough love? Probably we all have enough things because it's, there's lots of stuff. So I think we have enough stuff and we try to um, minimize extra stuff, don't we? Because when you have too much stuff, then you need more space and then you feel more um, compressed because of too many things. But I think what people really are feeling is um, more of an internal depletion. So this question, do you have enough love? Do you have enough peace? Do you have enough time? Time is a very intangible thing, really. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about how we can extend our perception of these things, because they're very difficult to quantify. Sister Denise, could I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we do have translation in Spanish, and I just thought to announce that. And just to keep things rolling, we have muted everyone. Please, we ask you to, we welcome you to put your questions in the chat. And at the end of the talk, we will, Sister Denise will be happy to answer your questions, okay? So thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Thank you so much. And I, I think I must talk slightly slowly so it's e easier for our translators. So going back to this question of, do you have enough of the intangibles like love? And there's another one which is kind of tangible, but yet intangible. And that is to do with company because during these many, many months of COVID re regulations and restrictions and all that, uh, many people have had to spend a lot more time on their own than they would otherwise, because there are restrictions on who can go where. And so we have been having to deal with this question of isolation. <coughs> Excuse me. And we are social beings, human beings are, have a natural tendency to come together in families and can be a biological family, it can be a spiritual family, it can be a family of people with similar interests, but we tend to enjoy company with each other because we, um, as, a, as a give and take of personal energy that goes on. <clears throat> and the question I was asking earlier about, do you have enough love, is connected with that. Because when you're spiritually depleted, you're depleted in areas of these quintessential qualities of the human soul. And one of those is love, and then there's peace and bliss and personal power and uh, purity. So when we are full in these five areas, then we don't feel that there's anything lacking, even though there may be greater or lesser amount of physical things, but our perception of our state of fulfillment 
is actually more connected with these inner intangible qualities. And so this evening, I would like us to really look at those and our ability to perceive how we're doing on the inside and, and check our levels. What is my level of peace, my level of love, my level of a personal power? And while we do get a great deal from one another, when you are connected with other people who are also depleted, then they also want to take energy from you. So we take energy from each other, but being relatively depleted, we probably can't get quite enough. And so it creates this feeling inside that I, I don't have enough love, I don't have enough inner power, I don't have enough quiet or serenity. I don't have that sense of the wonder of life. And there's this emptiness that's a little intangible, but a certain emptiness, which makes us look externally for different ways to fill that hole in the soul. And usually, because we are in the material world, and we are totally connected with our sense perceptions, it's natural for us to look for different ways to fill this inner void with uh, physical things. And it's interesting that we do that because you can't actually fill a spiritual need with physical thing. And I think this is connected with addictions, addictive behavior, addictive personalities. Um, because an addiction isn't necessarily just addiction to um, alcohol or some illegal drugs. There are lots of different things that we use to make ourselves feel better. And, you know, recently there was a lot of attention on how the social media is really very addictive um, because it um, plays into people's feelings of neediness or maybe lack of self-confidence. And it actually... Um, plays around with people's emotions through different algorithms, and it actually does create um, an, addic an addiction, an addictive situation where people are really quite damaged. And so this has been brought to the attention of the uh, legislature um, because these new technologies appear much more quickly than uh, our ability to understand if there's any harmful effects and if so, how to restrict them. So this is something that is um, quite new, uh, artificial intelligence and so on. And how much does it um, make us uh, think that we are getting something that fills that hole in the soul, but what it's actually doing is increasing the size of the hole in the soul, and we end up going down a dark hole, and um, then you, you can't find a way out. And I think that this is also an indicator to me uh, that there is a spiritual aspect about this because our internal feeling that we have, our internal feeling about our value as a human being, our um, sense of self, our, are we um, a good person? Are we um, valid, uh, important? Um, what is my worth? 
you know we we always evaluate these the worth of a person in terms of how much money they have or something like this but self-worth is something different and it's really to do with how you feel deep down on the inside and that feeling is actually in the soul in the soul in the heart in the being all these different words don't refer to something physical they do refer to the spiritual part because we are combinations of the spirit and the physical but uh, when we are so connected with the physical world through our sense perceptions the subtle things sometimes get missed or forgotten or these very strong energies that are around us they really pull us away from our spiritual core and then uh, people many people realize that there is um, a problem in terms of they get depleted spiritually depleted by all of this and then we seek ways to restore ourselves so that we do not feel depleted and then our relationship with our circumstances externally changes because of how you feel on the inside and so let's look a little bit more at um, this mechanism of how you feel about yourself on the inside you know the messages that we receive throughout our whole life are to do with our physical appearance um, and you know the ideal somebody's ideal is you have to be tall thin tan blonde and 25 years old and there's not too many people who fit that and even if they do it only lasts for one year so <laughs> it's not very practical but yet um, the images that we see of models on magazines and in different uh, social media and so on you have to look cool and you have to have the latest greatest clothing and you need brand names and all of this but one of the things i've noticed is starting to happen is that young people especially are um calling this out and saying you know it's good to have clothes that last a longer time because that's good for the environment um all of our rapid and massive consumption is definitely not good for the environment and people care about the planet our climate change conference has been going on and the reports that you see in the news are that um, there's serious danger of uh, a collapse of the balance of the climate and nobody really is taking it seriously enough and then there are many things which are you know not possible for human beings to do anything about and so people who are attentive on this impact of climate change and the rapidity with which it is advancing uh, they really care and especially young people are thinking about the years ahead maybe older people don't have so many years ahead so they don't care about it in the same way but um, it, it makes us think about our relationship with physical things that are used through the advertising industry and consumer um, manufacturers and so on to to persuade people that they don't have enough and we have bought into it it's been going on since basically the end of the second world war so that's a long time and if you look at um, how people felt about 
physical objects. It was a lot simpler in earlier times. Look at how much electricity we need to have in order to make all our gadgets work. And in um, the, the house that I'm in at the moment was from about the 1890s. And at that time, there wasn't any electricity. But the house was very modern because it had gas running through and the lighting was gas. And there was just like one or two lights, no electricity. Uh, cooking was simple, less water, less wires, all of these things, there was less. And also there was a lot less of this electronic buzzing and, um, you know, the different vibrations that are running through the air that you can't see, but which are filling the air with a certain kind of electronic pollution. And I think that these things do affect our brains because our brains run on and electrical pulses. And so these things uh, can, can interfere with the um, smooth movements of energy going on in our brains. And the soul is absolutely dependent on the brain to um, experience life, you see, because a human soul without a body cannot experience anything. And so if you have a good body, that's better because you, you do well when you have good health, when your eyes are good, your ears are good, um, all of your instruments for sensing the material world. When everything is good, you have this beautiful symbiotic relationship between body and spirit between matter and spirit between you and the natural world you and the human world the animal world everything is in balance and in harmony and when things are like that then you feel good uh, harmony is a very important ingredient to our our sense of well-being and even if you don't have much in the way of stuff or many in the way of friends and people, but if you're in harmony with the people and the environment, your own body and circumstances, destiny, then you don't feel that you don't have enough. You feel good because everything feels right. And when everything feels right, you don't have to think about it. So you don't think about it. It's really when things are not right that you start noticing it, feeling it, and it's natural to try to do something about it. And so the um, subject that we're looking at today is this shifting from the feeling of not enough to the feeling of enough. And I'm um, emphasizing the word feeling because it all depends on how we feel about it, not really on what the quantity is. Um, for some people where they, they, they can't have enough, it's a sign of addiction. One of the phrases in addiction recovery, they say one is... Uh, too many, and um, any amount that you have more than that is never enough. And so it, it sets up this craving. And you will do the addictive behavior or take in the addictive substance, even when you you feel that it's harming you, but you just are under its influence and you just do it. And the sign of an addiction is when you continue to do something in spite of the negative consequences. So when a person is in harmony with 
people and the environment and so on, then any time you do something which is not good for you, you feel it and you stop it. So that's correct. That's that's normal. That's non-addictive. But there are so many um, people in this sense of insufficiency uh, who try to manage that feeling of insufficiency, that feeling of not enough energy, that feeling of I'm not okay, I have to be more, better, faster, etc. And we get we get caught up in this um, this atmosphere that has been created by people um, wanting more, and then um, then we feel very depleted. So we have to go inside first of all to feel ourself. Uh, because the self is not really the body. The self is the one who inhabits the body, the spirit, the soul, that one. That's the real me. And it's quite difficult to feel yourself. You can feel your hands and feet and hair and fingernails and all the different parts of your body because you have the sense of touch. You can feel if you're cold or warm. You feel the textures something is pleasant, something is unpleasant. But there's another instrument of sensing, and it goes by different names. You could call it your intuition. Uh, you could call it um, something like just feeling. Um, you could call it your heart. Um, these are all different words that people use when they want to express something about themselves which is much more subtle than the physical feelings. So though we use the same word feelings for the inner feelings and the outer, but we'll qualify it with something like this word inner and outer. And um, it's very important for a spiritual being to be um, connected with the self. And what happens to people as they get spiritually depleted is there is this sense of loss of contact with the inner being. And then we become, our, our energy gets pulled out into the material world and we become under the influence of the things that we can feel and sense and um, experience uh, in the material world. But think about this, and this is a matter of perception. Uh, we have sense perception, but when you look at something, anything, wherever you happen to be right now, you, you look at what's around, you're in a room or you're somewhere, you have a screen where you can see me talking, but there's other things around. And actually, all of these things are registered in your mind. So while you're seeing these things and hearing these things, and you, you have the impression that these things are happening outside your body because that's where they seem to be and they are indeed outside your body but you are actually registering your sense impressions in your mind and this is why we have this expression it's all in the mind um, but what does that really mean it's all in the mind so let's go a little deeper and think about this fact which is not what you feel so there's kind of difference between facts and feelings in this sense that it is a reality that your all of your experiences are registered in your mind and whatever is happening on the outside of you you actually have the possibility to pick and choose what you actually register and so that depends on your focus of attention. Um, 
something that uh, draws your attention, either it's um, very strongly attractive visually or auditorily or smell or something like this, it will pull your attention and then it has you. And, and that's all that you're experiencing is that. And you can see how this is used in, in movies to uh, totally bombard you with um, sensory experiences. And, and actually you get exhausted by something like that. I remember one time noticing this in a very specific way. I used to live in Los Angeles and we would get visitors from different countries and everybody wanted to go to Disneyland. So one year I accompanied visitors to Disneyland 19 times in one year. That's, that's a lot. You know? And then there was one occasion where I went to Disneyland in uh, south, south of LA in Santa Ana and there were no people because it was winter or something. I don't know, but there was no space in between the rides and each ride is big sensory bombardment. And so um, within this period of two or three hours, whatever it is, going from ride to ride to ride and full sensory bombardment, I could really feel how much this exposure to strong sense impressions really depletes your personal spiritual energy. And um, most of the time, there's a, a lot of sensory bombardment going on. <clears throat> your attention is pulled by sounds or sirens going on or people doing things or TV shows, movies, whatever, whatever. There's just tons of stuff going on. And it really exhausts the soul. It pulls your energy because you are pulled to the outside of your body. And your mind, which is on the inside of your being, <clears throat> is being bombarded and it's being depleted by all this. So just living in the world as it is at the moment means that you are getting depleted. Even if you hardly do anything, you just get depleted. And so we need to protect ourselves against that. And we do this uh, by working with our focus of attention. And take this word distraction. You're doing something something happens, you get distracted by that thing, your concentration breaks. And then you have to go back to what you were doing and figure out where you were or what, what was happening. And uh, you kind of lose time getting reconnected with what you were focused on. And um, I think it's very important when you're wanting to develop yourself in this way to practice working with distractions so that you don't actually get distracted by a distraction unless you happen to want to be. Um, <clears throat> a distraction is something that's happening other than what you happen to be focused on. And there are some things that are happening that you need to pay attention to. Like if you smell burning, you better pay attention. There may be a fire. Or if you hear uh, a, a child screaming or something, maybe there's an accident, maybe you have to pay attention to that. But most of the things that interfere with your perception are distractions that actually you don't need to pay attention to. So a very helpful thing to do is to practice focusing on something that you're doing, or you can be focusing on your meditation and just see how many things are there to distract you and practice being very quick in registering. <clears throat> this is a distraction that I don't need to be distracted by. 
and within a nanosecond you cut that pull and you remain with your own intended focus this is a really good practice because it really helps you to realize that there's just tons of things out there that want to take over your attention and you need to protect yourself against that because it does deplete your energy and it reduces your independence um, because you become under the influence of those distractions which are not according to your will <clears throat> and so this also means that it's going to deplete your willpower and a person with depleted willpower can easily be taken over by circumstances situations and whatnot and so part of spiritual practice is to in increase and really um, strengthen your willpower and a person in a very good state is somebody who does what they want when they want if they want for how long they want and not if they don't want that means you are your own master if that is going on <clears throat> now of course we are not living alone we are living with other people with situations so we cannot impose our will all the time because we we have to have a certain amount of flexibility but we need to really develop this power of discernment where you really um, are sure about what you don't have to do and there's a great deal that you don't have to pay attention to and stay with yourself stay with your focus and in this way you um, don't get so depleted and you're always in contact with your deeper self so this is a very very important thing and the world we live in at the moment uh, is, is, is designed to prevent that so you have to resist and that's just the way the world is at the moment so we have to deal with it we don't live in an ideal world, but there is quite a lot that we can do for ourselves to make it the best um, within the circumstances, within the limitations that we have. And so strengthening our willpower and learning how to not be distracted by unnecessary distractions is going to help a great deal. So let's look at the internal qualities, these uh, quintessential qualities, um, love. Everybody wants love. Everybody needs love. Um, and the way the world has um, uh, manipulated us is to tell us that love means you're attracted by someone and someone is attracted by you and then there is an exchange of energy through physical interaction through emotional interaction or whatever and this exchange of energy is told to you that this is love um and and most people say yeah yeah this is love but actually what it is is an exchange of energy and when the parties concerned are taking energy from each other and both are depleted, then you, you don't get what you need, but you also lose a lot of personal energy in the process of trying to increase your energy in the form of love. And, and so this is called uh, a deceptive situation there is an expression which i think is quite helpful and they say only a powerful soul can offer love and what is a powerful soul i think you could say that a, a person 
who really knows how to take care of their inner being and nurture themselves, they become a powerful soul because you're all the time empowering yourself. And what is really helpful is to know that when you are wanting to take energy from people who are spiritually depleted, you can't get that much, no matter how hard you try. And also other people are using up your energy. Now, what's important to know is that there's a source of energy that is not depleted. And if we can connect with that source of energy, then we're able to actually fill ourselves and even allow it to flow out, not all of it, but it's like when you have a, a glass of water and you fill that glass and you let the water flow over, the glass is always going to be full, but because there's more and more water coming, it's flowing away. And so if you have a glass of water held over a big bowl, then that bowl will also fill because so much water is, is coming more than the glass can contain. And so this is a, an analogy that um, refers to what happens when you connect with a higher power, the source, the force, God, the supreme being, the light. There's so many different words for this, but there's definitely something and it's a spiritual source. So spiritual sources are not things, they're beings. And uh, so I would say the supreme soul, we, we are souls and souls that are depleted. So we need to fill. <clears throat> and our filling needs to come from a source that is endless that is um, there's enough for all the depleted souls in the world to fill on and still doesn't get empty so there is such a thing but it's very subtle not because it's not physical and so how do you connect with that you have to use your mind Everybody has a mind, but you've never seen your mind, have you? People say, this is my mind, I have a mind, something's on my mind. You may have a mind to do something, an intention. Um, you, you feel something in your mind. You have intuition about something in your mind. Um, you get an idea in your mind. You feel depressed in your mind. You feel happy in your mind. So your mind is something, but um, you've never seen it because it's not a physical object. And, uh, you, you know, even if you would study medicine and go through all the physiology of a, of a human body, you wouldn't find the mind. You find the brain. And the, the brain has different areas which are... Uh, represent different types of feelings, but none of those areas is the mind. Because the mind is a, an attribute of the soul, you see. And, and meditation and spiritual practice is something that you do with the mind and in the mind. And so it's important for us to be able to detect the mind. And so your soul is an energy. And that energy um, can take the form of your mental faculties, your mind. And so love is something that you experience in your mind is feeling. And, and there is also this mystery of deception you know sometimes you decide you you love someone and then then they should also love you back and then that carries on for a while and then 
it kind of runs out because there's an exchange of energy between two who love each other. And then um, unless you really bring something into it from another source, it will burn out, it will fizzle out. But because we are led to believe that this one is supposed to love me and, and that should carry on indefinitely, but they're depleted, they can't, you know, and they, they feel the same about you, but you're depleted, you can't. And this is why we have so many, um, so many experiences of love turning bad, turning into disappointment, turning into sometimes even hatred. Uh, and it's simply because the need that the soul has to fill with this energy of love can only really be filled when there is contact with the original source of love, which is the Supreme Being. And so we need to learn how to become subtle enough to feel it. And for that, we need to withdraw from uh, being living on the outside of the body. You know, you, you're living in your sense perceptions. And so you're con in contact only with the material reality. And in meditation, you withdraw, you, you go in so that you can uh, create in your mind um, a distance between your inner self and the outer world. That's a very good first step. Because when you pull your attention and focus your attention on the inside, then you're able to detect what is there on the inside. So when you focus your attention on the inside um, with the intention to feel the quintessential characteristics of your soul, you will do that. Uh, you'll be able to feel the, your peace and feel your love. And there's a difference. The feeling of peace is different from the feeling of love, different from the feeling of purity, different from the feeling of happiness. All these different feelings are very subtle, like colors or like musical tones. And we have to use metaphors and analogies for this because it's so subtle and it's so deep inside and it's really non-physical. But we um, respond to color and music and atmosphere and other things that are on the outside that actually take us to the inside. And, and so this is very helpful. Um, when you're on the inside, you're actually on the non-material level. The spirit is itself non-material and the mind itself is non-material. So when the energy of the mind is turned back upon itself and you focus on your own self and feel yourself as a pure, peaceful, powerful, loveful, blissful being of light. Um, just by focusing your attention on it, you get to be able to feel it because you can only feel something that you focus your attention on, whether it's outside or inside. We're so used to sense perception, we don't even think about it. We're so unused to going inside, we have to think about it. And so learning meditation is step-by-step -step process. We have to experiment and explore the inner world and give yourself time, uh, come to understand how it's done and what are the 
the signs and signals that help you along the way so that you are really connected with the deepest part of yourself. And then you come to realize that you're actually not what everybody always tells you. Uh, your identity as a spiritual being is nothing to do with your ID that just talks about how you function in the material world and it talks about your body, but it never really talks about who you are. And so it's important to think of yourself as this extraordinary being, but who is depleted on the inside. And this is why there is this experience of not having enough, not being enough, not doing enough. And um, sometimes even you get um, messages from other people, you're not good enough, you're not powerful enough, you're not clever enough, you're not this enough, you're not that enough. You hear these things so much and uh, you start to believe it. But then when you start to turn inside and, uh, and understand that this not enough is there, but there is something you can do about it, which is nothing to do with the people around you or the circumstances around you, but it's a very deep and private matter between you and yourself. How many people are there on the inside of your head? Who is seems to be quite a few different you, one talking to the other, arguing, all these things. But these are different facets of your being. It's only one being. And you want to make contact with the source that can enable you to take energy so that you feel on the deep, inside of yourself, that from being depleted, you're gradually taking in that energy. It's energy, it's light. Sometimes you can experience it like that, energy and light. A little bit like electricity, a little bit like when your, your um, device is run out of charge, you get a message from it that says battery low, and you go and find your charger and charge it up. In the same way, the soul is like a kind of battery that powers the body and it gets low. And so you have to charge it up. And this is another way of thinking about meditation. Meditation is sitting quietly with yourself, focused on the inside, in contact with yourself as a soul. And then just send your thought upwards, out there, because the source is out there. And a thought is instant. The speed of thought is the fastest thing there is, absolutely instant. So when you make a thought, a focused, sincere, real thought to connect, you connect. And this connection is a relationship. You're in relationship with the source of love, the source of peace, the source of light, the source of wisdom actually also. And bring that into yourself. It's very subtle. Um, you have to experiment. Because everyone really does it in their own way. But these are some of the basics. And you realize that you want to take a lot of charge to feel complete and fulfilled and satisfied. And why we 
find ourselves wanting to meditate frequently is that this energy that we take in, we also use it in our relationships, our interactions, our different activities, because all the time it's being applied in action. So we need to try to take in actually more than we're putting out so that there's an accumulation because you can't just sit and meditate forever just sitting like that that's not going to work you have to live you have to do things there's people and so on and so forth but you need to take some time to do this people routinely charge their devices when they are asleep at night because then you can have a few hours to charge your device but Actually, when you go to sleep at night, you are also restoring your mind and your body. So enough sleep is very important. But it's important to meditate as well, because then you actually um, are taking something additional, something that cannot be given to you just by sleep. Because when you go to sleep, the soul detaches from the body. And so you do get restored, but the soul doesn't connect with the source. You just detach from the body. So that's good, but you need more than that. You need to actually plug into the source and pull that light, pull that energy, pull that love, pull that peace into yourself and establish yourself in um, a very subtle discreet, private interaction with that source so that you can get to know that source because it's not a thing. It's actually a, there's a being who is um, putting out all that energy and you start catching it. And uh, the more you develop that relationship, the more easy it is for you to plug in and ensure that there's a good flow coming into you and that you really are shifting from not enough to enough and though you're using it all the time but you know how to keep it topped up and and increase your um, amount so that you become gradually more stable in how internally powerful you are, how harmonious you are, regardless of what's going on on the outside of you, because you're also concentrated. And you know how to protect yourself from getting unnecessarily depleted. So I will stop there and um, turn it over to Elizabeth. And maybe we can uh, talk about this a little bit together and you may have some questions. Well, I really enjoyed, um, Sister Denise, what you shared. It almost, <clears throat> I would like to make a comment and segue into a question, if I may. And of course, any of you who have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand and I can unmute you individually. <clears throat> um, I, I really love how you share, especially when you shared from your experience going to Disneyland and being over, uh, you know, stimulated. <clears throat> and in a way, the very thing of addiction is to avoid the experience of living. <laughs> um, because we're afraid of the pain of the suffering um, for the challenges for the in negative relationships, or I should say any relationship can turn sour. And um, so we find ourselves, you know, merging ourselves or inundating ourselves with distractions. So why bother? I'm here I'm being the devil's advocate here um, or angel's advocate. Um, 
why even have a body? Why don't I just have that lovely experience being connected with the source for eternity? Why should I bother even coming into the body so that I have to even, you know, try and, you know, run away from the suffering and pain in uh, and um, find addictions to, um, you know, distract myself when really right in front of me to embrace life, to embrace, you know, have a sense of myself. And I could really feel it when you were speaking. And then I thought, wait a minute. So what's this game all about? Why is it so important to face our stuff? What is, what is that um, succession of events that brings us into stillness? So there's my question. <laughs> all right. Yeah. yeah. Very, very important, powerful question. Exactly. Why? Why should we do all this? Well, one interesting thing to be aware about is that unless you have a body, you can't experience anything. So the the aspect of experience is very important. And our experiences are a huge spectrum, all the way from the most horrible to the most e extraordinary and amazing. And we are, I think, full spectrum people, especially people who are really very spiritual, they're full spectrum, full from the agony and the ecstasy, as um, was said about uh, Michelangelo. So, uh, you know, when when people have to go for um, uh, psychotherapy um, because they they go too high and too low, so they get um, psychotropic drugs which chop off the top and the bottom, and then they stay in the middle uh, because they can't handle the highs and the lows. But um, when you when you really become powerful uh, through your meditation practice and through handling your stuff and facing your stuff, then you are actually able to manage the highs and the lows and they don't become unmanageable because you have power to go very high and very low and handle it, you see. And, and this is called spiritual power. So it's not that, um, I, I don't think it's so interesting to just stay in some middle spot where it's not too high and not too low. I think that's a bit too boring. Um, for me, it's better to be able to go all the way to the high and all the way to the low, but manage it. So managing feelings is something that many people have a hard time with. Um, and when you're spiritually depleted, you cannot manage those feelings. But when you're spiritually empowered, you can. That's really the difference. Um, I, I, re I remember, you know, when it comes to pain, pain is there in life. You have emotional pain, financial pain, social pain, physical pain, emotional pain, so many different kinds of pain. And your threshold of pain may not be very high. So even a little bit of pain, you can't take it. And then you have to medicate. You have to take some drug or do something to manage the pain because you yourself cannot manage it. But um, when your threshold for managing these uh, different, maybe, intense feelings is um, great, then um, then you, you're not afraid of pain, you're not controlled by it. You, you're judicious so that if you have a very serious physical pain, you need to use pain medication. But you know, there are some situations where some people experience, they, they have a need for medical uh, things, but they can't get it because of the circumstances. And then there you are. So if you can manage, especially, I think, emotional pain, you know, people use uh, 
drugs to manage emotional pain. And I think that when you really take in good amount of spiritual power, you can actually manage the pain. And, and why is it useful to be able to manage the pain? I discovered, uh, much to my surprise, that pain is a great teacher. And the wisdom and lessons that come to us when we work through our pain actually make us into better people, more mature, more um, compassionate, uh, more, I think, more authentic. And so it's very, very advantageous to be able to take benefit from the great teachings that that pain can can give us. And you hear sometimes of people who who say some terrible thing happened to them. And yet they say this is the best thing that happened to me because it really brought me back to myself. And so I think that um, just to say that anything unpleasant is bad, and so we want to avoid it is to miss out on a very important dimension of the human experience. And, uh, you know, life, life is full of all the things. And sometimes people say, you know, why is it like that? It shouldn't be like that. And in, in spiritual study and spiritual practice, we start to hear that it's not really about why is it like that and it should or shouldn't be like that the thing to pay attention on is it is and let's go deep into it and really understand it because we have to come to terms with it there's something very important about our personal development as as individuals is to be able to come to terms with what happens and um, be able to in many situations transcend it not be overwhelmed by it and and all of this serves to make us stronger more resilient more compassionate more total uh, as as a human being so then we we have a lot to bring to our relationships also we're not just takers but we can become givers you know thank you um sister denise uh one question we have a couple questions here and we have um jeffrey with a raised hand <clears throat> uh, let me get to um uh neil is asking how do we recognize when we are under outside or external influences um, that are not so positive? How do we know? Well, I think we, we eventually do get the message, usually when it's kind of too late. Um, but we have clocked up a lot of experience of these things. And when you use your experience to make yourself a little wiser because these things do tend to recur and when you analyze the circumstances in which you got overwhelmed by something it could be something that attracted you and pulled you away from yourself or it could be something that controlled you through fear and um, you become aware that you are a little weak in certain areas so that these things can take over and you don't want that and so you get gradually wise uh, you're not starting from zero you're starting from a, a fair amount of life experience but you want to make it better and um, so whenever something really quite untoward happens to you it's really useful as a spiritual exercise to analyze how you walked into a trap or how you gave away your power or how you made it possible for it to happen and bring it back to yourself. Otherwise, we always think it's 
the circumstance did it or the other person did it, but there's always something about us that allowed it. And, uh, and if we notice where we need to block it and we didn't block it, and then we can become a bit more skilled about it and a bit better at it. And that's a continuous um, improvement. So something like this, then you get good at it. Well, that really expands it a little bit further so that we, what you're saying is we are almost inviting these lessons. Is that what, <laughs> is it? Am I interpreting that? Um, yeah. So, <laughs> and in a way that's good. So that way I can manage it. I'm actually the creator of it. And another question was, okay, if I recognize and know that my senses are overstimulated and the soul is depleted, how do I heal and fill the soul? Well, ultimately, we have to establish order and personal <clears throat> discipline because, you know, if you meditate whenever you feel like it, it, it um, won't really happen. And so when we're learning about meditation, uh, we're told that you need to do it every day and you need to do it regularly and you need to increase the amount um, because you might not be able to stay focused for very long initially because you're finding your way with it. But um, it's just really, really good to bring in some discipline, some regularity, uh, because then there is a tension between what you decided to do and what circumstances want you to do. And you have to assert your will to do what you intend to do. And if you're not able to do that, then it tells you that you have a weak will. So you need to work on strengthening it and you do that by making a decision, I will meditate at this time to that time, you know, and of course, there are sometimes circumstances that you have to attend to, so then you have to shift it a bit, but mostly, um, it's really possible to find a time in the day, especially very early morning, you know, before your day starts, uh, you don't get much interference. And so, the early morning time, I mean, we <clears throat> learn that, you know, if you if you can meditate every day around four o'clock in the morning, you're very unlikely to get interference because everybody's sleeping around that time. And uh, no one will call you up, you know, on the phone or whatever, or turn it off, you know. And uh, if that's too early for you, but you find a time where you feel that you can regularly sit with yourself and do this and think about your soul, think about your essence and um, ponder upon it and uh, investigate it. Uh, this is going to give you that discipline that willpower that you that you need in order to be fully in charge of your life thank you um sister denise even as you were speaking it i could feel all of us kind of going into like a meditation into our essence mm. that's quite comforting um we have a question here from jeffrey you can ask jeffrey and then we have michael I'll put him on in a minute. So, Jeffrey. Hi there, Sister Denise. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Jorgensen. I had the, um, the pleasure of picking you up one time from the airport, but my mom is, uh, her name is Annie Jorgensen, and she's a very dedicated PK. Um, okay. And I'm very fortunate to have her as my mother. Um, and uh, I, I was listening to you talking today, and, and um, truth be told is, is I had... I, I battled with addiction like uh, throughout my life, um, and my mo my mother actually uh, introduced me to the BK philosophy, and there's so much of it that just resonated with me, and um, that kind of changed changed me, and like I've grown as a person because of it. 
Um, so, and, and also <laughs> from, from the short time I've, I've had, uh, with you, I, I could, you, you stood out and, and, and it was like, you had this perception that could just cut through. It was, it was amazing, but you, you had a very, you're a very perceptive person that could kind of cut through things and, and find the truth. And uh, today, uh, to just the reason why I'm, why I'm here today is because I was talking to her today and I was telling her, I'm, I'm actually coming out of the throes of addiction and, and, and I battled it with it for years. Um, but um, uh, I, I'm kind of trying to come back into relationships that I've had before. And I'm literally ashamed, dealing with shame and embarrassment because I was addicted for, for years. And um, it, it's hard, you know, and, and uh, I haven't cried for years, but I was on the phone with her today and I was, and I was bawling my eyes out telling her how uh, I'm trying to recreate these connections that I was ashamed to, to connect with before. Um, and, uh, you know, she, she connected me with this, this chat and I've been listening to this chat and I already respected you from just that. It only took a moment to to know to know who you were and and uh, respect you, but that's kind of where I'm at, and that's why I'm why I'm in this chat. And, uh, well, it, it's really courageous of you to keep going with that battle and um, assert your right to be free, and. Um, and that you allow yourself to be as sensitive as you are in a world which is quite often very cruel. And so congratulations and um, keep moving forward. And one of the wonderful things that I think all of us experience is that when we do let go and really uh, reveal our tender spots, um people love us for it and they um honor us and they um come close and they are very supportive and uh because because the ego has fallen away when you do that and and the problem between people is the ego you try and show that you are tough and all of these things and behind it is a tender heart um which is trying to deal with a big bad world and um it's not so easy yes thank you um sister denise and thank you jeffrey um really appreciate that really uh from the heart and then we have michael has a question for you actually i don't remember what it was it was more of a comment when you were talking about pain I, I thought you said that we learn from pain, or that's, I don't remember exactly what you said, so. I, I, I said that pain is a great teacher. Yeah. And, 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 and we have to um, work through it, definitely, uh, come to terms with our pain, definitely, and listen deeply to its messages because there are times when we need to surrender to the pain because when we resist the pain we're resisting the message that it has is pain is a messenger and tells you something very important that you haven't understood and it will come along and say i'm going to give you more and more pain until you get the message and then you have to kind of relax and stop resisting and really listen and uh, understand something about yourself uh, that the pain has um, has a duty to let you know and it will do its duty however much pain you need so uh, if if it's not bad enough it'll get worse until you 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 surrender and say okay tell me i'm listening <laughs> and it will let you know slow down or take it easy or be nice or something there's a message which is only for you yeah and i guess my thinking was it's not so much it pain pains a signal to me it's not so much it teaches me but it it gives me the opportunity to take a look at the situation and see how i'm not thinking correctly and 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 that if i can think more correctly there won't be the pain that's right exactly 
-hmm. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Sister Denise. We have, oh, um, oh sure. Uh, we have Harbans. You want to ask a question? Is this Harbans? Am I pronouncing yeah. that right? Yeah. Yes, yes, Lily. Uh, yes, go ahead. Hi, Lily. Uh, Denise, uh, very happy to see you here also. And I uh, saw many times on TV shows. And I am your fan, I can say. And uh, I uh, and this lecture is also amazing. Very good. Great lecture. Just when I uh, uh, read the title of the lecture, then I was uh, just started thinking the, what Didi will say about it, this lecture, what type of lecture it will be. So I am on. The, my question is that uh, during meditation, Didi, we should be aware of uh, the external stimuli external word because you have mentioned that uh, we should analyze uh, to feel the focus of attention you know you mentioned in the lecture that you we should practice it that we should drag our attention and we should be in that very same environment and we should focus our attention on the supreme power so that means what do you say that i should practice my meditation while coping with the external environment or I should just uh, be in an environment where there is no noise or like that. What do you say? Right. Um, it's always preferable when you're practicing meditation to have the best possible circumstances, but Right. Um, you know, for example, we uh, in the Raj Yoga that I do, we meditate with open eyes. Mm -hmm. So you see what's going on, mm. but your attention is on the inside. Yeah. And, and why we uh, practice like this is so that we can carry it further yeah. into interaction, daily life, so that you can be mm -hmm. in a relatively meditative state and yeah. remain connected with inside mm -hmm. and still doing activity so we call yeah. this karma yoga you're doing yeah. karma you're still mm -hmm. in yoga and mm -hmm. you're able to maintain your focus in mm -hmm. spite of distractions mm -hmm. but when you're practicing you're trying mm -hmm. to develop these capabilities and yeah. when you're out there in the day-to-day -day world, mm -hmm. you're really experimenting to see how you're doing and, mm -hmm. and how uh, you're able to maintain that internalized state while at the same time interacting with circumstances yeah. and people. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Didi. One more question. And uh, it's similar type uh, of question which Didi asked you the first question that um, why it's so important to come back from Paramdham because sometimes it happens. Um, I feel uh, the soul going up in Paramdham and again, sometimes I'm there, but I just start the other, my uh, means attention may be uh, maybe on any other side, you can say, is it not good? Because sometimes it happens. Is it very necessary to go and come back in the in that very second or in some time? Uh, because sometimes you see, I, it's uh, like this. Yeah. Your mind is very fast mm -hmm. and it's quite difficult to maintain focus for a very long time. And oh, also yes. you get very rigid if you do that. Mm -hmm. So you have to be light, you have to be balanced. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you can be focused without being rigid. Mm -hmm. And you can come and go easily mm -hmm. without being distracted. And, mm -hmm. and so this is all a matter of developing your, um, your capacity and your understanding of what meditation really is. Because it's not a technique as such um, okay. ultimately it's about really being with yourself while in the midst of things uh, without mm. them taking over you always maintain your position of the master 
So I think there are some other questions. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Didi. Thank, thank you. you, Harbans. Thank you. Um, Sister Denise, we have a question here uh, from CA We or CA We Yi. Please uh, correct me. Um, but it's a very interesting take on enough is enough. How can we deal with situations when we, when we want to say enough is enough? When people are taking advantage of us, knowing that we are on a spiritual path, taking action or not taking action is the question. Well, you need to know how to protect yourself, how to put a stop to interference and um, stand up for yourself. You know, a, lo a lot of people think that if you're a meditator, you shouldn't stand up for yourself, but that's a mistake. You have to know when to stand up for yourself, how to stand up for yourself, when to put limits and, um, and don't be a doormat that people walk all over you because being peaceful does not mean um, being incapable of holding your own. That, that's um, a misunderstanding altogether. Mm. Thank you, that's important to know. Thank you, Sister Denise. Um, and then um, Megna was asking about dreams, um, dreams and nightmares. Um, how do they play out for us? Is this something that we should pay attention to? So the question is, um, if someone gets a lot of dreams or nightmares, they may be totally unrelated to the past and present. How to interpret that? Is there any significance of that, of dreams? Well, dreams is a whole big subject and um, several lectures are required just on dreams. Yeah. So I can't really answer it in one second, but you know, some dreams are symbolic and messages. Um, some are premonitions. Some are just stuff that happened in the day that comes out in some um, symbolic or metaphoric form. Um, because it needs to be processed and so it will take the form of a dream sometimes but it's a very big subject yeah and uh, we have to look at that um ariel did you want to ask a question for sister denise hi sister denise hi sister hi. elizabeth hi M more not more of a question more of a um a observation and i guess a little feedback to that um, first of all, uh, I'm very grateful to be here today. I had missed the last three classes and I, I beat myself up about it. <laughs> but I was so busy, um, but I'm so glad I, I caught this message. And it's so funny because um, um, I'm not sure if El Sister Elizabeth will um, remember, but I will always come to this, you know, to these meetings. And I'm like, I was just thinking about what you guys are talking about now and the same thing happened today and I feel so blessed um, to be able to make it and I wanted to bring up the fact um, about the and it's so funny I wanted this about about how you said about the two souls can um two people can properly love each other as if the energies are depleted and um that's exactly what I'm going through right now. And um, I, I was battling with myself, like what's wrong, you know, what's, what's going on. And um, I really do see now, now it's, it's clear to me that um, there's no way it can, it can go properly if those two souls are not complete within themselves. Exactly, exactly. you got it. <laughs> yes, yes. And I'm so, and I guess now I can start, now I can actually look within other than looking without in this situation, um, looking out of the situation. Now I can actually be more mindful of the things that I say, you know, um, in that moment um, where I didn't understand what was going on. Now I'm more, definitely more mindful in that. And um, I would also like to add about the meditation. Um, I know a lot of, uh, a lot of people can't concentrate can't even feel like that that would even happen but I am here to tell you guys that it is possible and I think the more you do practice meditation and how I use how I really started practicing my meditation was with my um, with with music um then I sort of 
uh, tuned it out. And then I'm like, I think I'm ready to be even in a, the loudest environment and only hear my thoughts. And it's, it actually started happening um, lately, about a couple months ago. And it was the best, it's the best feeling ever. And right. I'm definitely here Thank to tell you. everyone, yes, keep meditating, keep practicing it. For, you know, first couple of times, you're going to get angry and upset at the, even the environment that you cannot control. And I think that's right. the main situation, the main thought process that you cannot control that. Thank <laughs> no you so you much. Go. Thank you, Ariel. Thank yeah. you so much. Mm. Thank you so much. God yes. bless you all. Yes, thank you, Ariel. And of course, we remember you. <laughs> <laughs> so now um, I think we've reached the end of the program time and we want to honor your time. And of course, this it's always good to leave with wanting more even though we should have enough <laughs> but we'll be able to um, um, indulge ourselves with more insights next Tuesday on the power of silence with sister Denise so we welcome you to next Tuesday evening talk um, sister Denise would you like to close with some meditation a short little meditation surely yeah so let's practice um, gently, slowly, little by little, going inside. Feel the energy of your being throughout your body and then just gently pull your energy to the inside so that you're concentrated in the center of the forehead. You look out through your eyes, but you're behind the eyes. You hear things through the ears, but you yourself are still and quiet. can feel temperature, texture. The smells, the tastes. But you yourself are on the inside, quiet, detached. Being deep inside, you start to feel the peace of your soul. A beautiful, harmonious vibration that is your real self. You are at peace with yourself. You're at peace with your past. You know that you can't control everything that's happening around you, but you can let it be what it is and find your peace with it. It is what it is. In your heart, you love the world. After all, it's a family of humanity. It's your home. And there's only one planet Earth. There's only one humanity. You're part of it. Your love for the world 
gives life to the world and energy. And you love your own self. You recognize your value. And you just want to be the very best you that you can be. And that's enough. You turn your mind above, beyond, to the light that is there. Feel the energy of that light reaching you, filling you. Feel the love and the strength that's coming to you. Take it in deep. For it is yours to have and to hold and to use well. Om Shanti.